Uh, you'll notice uh, you didn't get a handout tonight. You will uh, have it soon. Um, some things came up. I wasn't able to quite get that all together here for tonight. Uh, but tonight's uh, theme is just about themes in the Psalms or themes in the Psalter. So we're going to look at three uh, different themes uh, tonight. And the first lecture, I am titling this uh, Psalms of Orientation, Disorientation, and New Orientation. Psalms of Orientation, disorientation, and new orientation. So we'll get into that now. Uh, you know the Bible teaches uh, that a healthy prayer life includes both weeping and rejoicing. And that this is a community action as much as it is an individual action. That we together are to, as Paul says in Romans 12.15... Rejoice with those who rejoice, and we are to weep with those who weep. And we all go through many different seasons of life, so we'll probably find ourselves in the weeping side and the rejoicing side quite often. And God gives us prayers and praises for those seasons. He gives us words that bring our lives into focus during the uh, rejoicing seasons and during the weeping season. And it also brings the lives of those around us into focus. That's what the Psalms do. So as we dwell in the Psalms, as we read the Psalms, as we inhabit the Psalms, as we live within them, the prophetic word that moves in directions of faith and hope strengthens us in whatever season we find ourselves in. That's why we need all the Psalms. We need all 150 of them. No matter what season we're in or, or how we feel at the time, we need to read them all. And uh, one helpful way of seeing or categorizing the Psalms is using uh, a designation coined by the Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann. And Brueggemann, uh, he categorizes the Psalms in what he calls Psalms of Orientation, or Psalms where everything, life is well and dandy, right? Psalms of Disorientation are, are Psalms where, oh my goodness, my life has been turned upside down, I'm sinking in the pit. And psalms of new orientation or psalms of, wow, being surprised by grace. Look what the Lord has done. He is so good. And so we're going to spend this lecture looking at how reading the psalms with that perspective helps us understand how the psalms help us in every season as it relates to prayer and praise. Not just individually, but corporately. How these psalms help us see each other better. So as we read the Psalms, it is easy to identify the theme of death and life. The Psalms in many ways are in the shape of crucifixion and resurrection. They show forth sin, pain, darkness, and death in all their gruesomeness. But they also show forth the surprise of grace and the surpassing beauty of what God does when he makes things new. There is radical hope in the Psalms just as there are radical cries for help. So there are some similarities here also to the truth of baptism, you know, as Christians approaching the Psalms. In baptism, we know there is a loss of the old world, right? And there is a, an embrace of the new world, an embrace of new creation. But even after baptism, Paul tells the Romans that we must still reckon ourselves dead to the old order. And we must reckon ourselves alive to new creation reality. And that that is a process that occurs all throughout life, that we constantly need to be reckoning ourselves in that way. That before we can walk in the fullness of the new reality, we must first awaken to the fact that some things must be reckoned as dead. And you know, one, the kind of psalms that help us reckon things as dead, as part of the old creation, is something we can move past are what Brueggemann calls the Psalms of Disorientation. The Psalms of Disorientation help us see what is wrong, and they help us rely on God who will bring us out of what is wrong and make us right. They help us rely on Jehovah Tzikindu, the Lord our righteousness, the one who makes things right in our life, the one um, who, who, who makes all things well. 
So the Psalms do not shy away from showing forth what is wrong in the world. They don't. They do not shy away from talking about trouble and enemies and pain and trial and talk about that is not anti-faith. In fact, it is an act of faith to name something for what it is. Brueggemann says this, that the Psalms reflect the difficult way in which the old worlds are relinquished and the new worlds are embraced. You know, a lot of times when we read the Psalms, most of us, most Christians, we tend to pick out the nice verses of the Psalms and leave the dark verses unspoken, right? Who wants to pick out all the dark verses in the Psalms and just meditate on those? We don't like that. We're, because we're not sure what to do with them, right? I mean, a lot of them, man, you read some of David's early Psalms in the first couple books of the Psalter from Psalms 1 to 72, and you think, oh my goodness, like we talked about last month, right? There is just mainly in there uh, a lot of gruesomeness. But the reality is that the verses of turmoil and screaming pain show us that God does not censor what is wrong with us. And he does not censor what is wrong with the world around us. God doesn't hide what is wrong and paint a veneer of false positivism over injustice. No, God paints a full picture of life. God sees people in their pain. And he doesn't call us to ignore evil. He causes us to pray, deliver us from evil. He causes us to name evil. He causes us, Paul says, to abhor what is evil and to cling to that which is good. So we must take the dark and painful parts of the Psalms as serious as the heartwarming and hopeful parts. And the reason why is because God and Jesus Christ has taken our darkness seriously. We know, as John says, that the light, Jesus Christ, shone in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome that light, Jesus Christ. The light of God entered our darkness and hung bleeding to death on a cross. God shows he is in the very midst of our ugliness and sin, and he is the one bearing it and carrying it down into the grave. This is one reason why David said that he did not need to fear even when surrounded by 10,000 armies. For that's exactly where God likes to dwell. God was with him. Psalm 139 says that we can never flee from God's presence. Even if we flee to the furthest ocean or make our bed in the realm of the dead, even there the Psalms say God is with us. So in the midst of darkness, we are led by the Psalms to name the darkness for what it is. We can say that is darkness, to share the pain it brings, but to ultimately embrace the light who will lead us out of it and into new life. So Brueggemann says this about the Psalms. He says, the Psalms are a boundary thrown up against self-deception. They do not permit us to ignore and deny the darkness personally or publicly, for that is where new life is given, whether on the third day or by some other uncontrolled schedule at work among us. So the Psalms have power in our life because we all know life is like what the Psalms display, especially those who have gone through the ringer. And in society that engages in so much denial and grows numb to darkness, <laughs> the Psalms help us name darkness. They help us, in the end, to speak hope. Because when we see darkness, we can see the light in the darkness, Jesus Christ. So, the three categories, Psalms of orientation, disorientation, and new orientation. First, the Psalms of orientation. What are these psalms? Many of the psalms celebrate the goodness of God's creation. That life is something to delight in. That creation is good. Or as God said, it is very good. You know, I mean, now it's infected by sin, but it is still God's good creation. That the Lord reigns on high over all his works. That we can have certain expectations in life. If we sow seed, we expect a plant will spring up from the ground, right? If we meditate on the word, 
we expect that we will be like a tree that is thriving by the rivers of water. These psalms and verses show forth the constancy of God, that God is trustworthy, that God is reliable. And so these are psalms of, you know, orientation. I, I have a slide here. This is uh, the psalms of orientation in a variety of ways articulate the joy, delight, goodness, coherence, and reliability of God, God's creation and God's governing law. So in these psalms, we see the world as, as God has intended it. In this world, there is no enemy slithering through his garden. There is no fox rampaging through his fields. Rather, there is happiness at work. There is joy with friends and family. There is gladness to go on pilgrimage to see the house of the Lord. Things are functioning as they are. As they ought, our hearts are filled with laughter. Think of Solomon with his palace of gold with strutting peacocks and groomed African elephants. <laughs> that is a psalm of orientation. Of Israel at rest, without fear of the enemy and full of abundance. Having good family and good society. You know, in the book of Judges, they had rest basically every 40 years before the enemy crept in again. Well, that time of rest we would call a state of orientation where things are what they should be. There is something that can be relied on that is guaranteed by God. So whenever we use these psalms, they continue to assure us that there is certainty despite all the incongruities of life. So not only do these psalms show us who God is, but as we pray them, they have the power to create that reality in our midst. God's word is a creative word. It calls those in states of instability to stability. When we understand that God is stable and we understand that God is in us, then it brings us to that realm. That's why we need the Psalms of orientation in every state of life. It calls those with no faith into a state of faith. Right? Faith comes by hearing the word. As we read of God's protective barrier around us, like Psalm 91, we are given a sense of assurance in that barrier, we have confidence in our never-changing God, even when our worlds are falling apart. That's why we need these kind of psalms. Now, these kind of psalms of orientation, they broadly fall into these categories. Songs of creation, songs of Torah and instruction, wisdom psalms. Um, here I want to give two examples. Psalm 37 is a good example of normal life, things working out, the kind of proverbial life that we see in the book of Proverbs, you know. Psalms 37, verse 1, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and the bow shall be broken. So here we see a confident assurance in this psalm, right? That the wicked's day, the wicked, you know, their, their day is mounting up to nothing, while the righteous are going to be protected by God. Um, but that's not the experience of all the psalmists, right? But this is telling us uh, of what is normally expected. That, that, you know, and we'll talk about more the goodness of, of what Christ means in that midst when we get to the wicked and the righteous in the next lecture. But here's uh, another, a psalm of creation. The idea of, of God over creation and how we can trust in him. Psalm 104 is a, a big psalm of creation. Verse 5. 
You who laid the foundations of the earth so that it would not be moved forever, right? Orientation, an unmovable, you know, we can trust in God of the earth. Verse 10, he sends the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Right, the, the wild donkeys aren't worried about nothing. By them the birds of the heavens have their home, like Jesus said, right? They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth, and the wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted, where the, where the birds make their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees, the high hills for the wild goats, the cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. Right? <laughs> Isn't this just beautiful reading, understanding? It's like Jesus said, look at the birds, right? God takes care of them. How much more will he not take care of you, O you of little faith? Well, look at all these different animals he's taking care of. He's taking care of everyone. We need this psalm of orientation to understand how good our God is. Verse 24, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. Let's just uh, go stop right there. Psalms of disorientation. What are psalms of disorientation? Here's a slide. Human life consists in anguished seasons of hurt, alienation, suffering, and death. These evoke rage, resentment, self-pity, and hatred. Matching this, we will consider psalms of disorientation. Now, I'm going to have some of this, these notes here for you when I get out the handout, so don't worry too much about writing you know, all this stuff down. We'll, we'll have this in the handout for you. Um, and, you know, what Psalms of Disorientation teach us is that nothing is out of bounds in terms of our communication with God. You know, uh, some people brought up to me something Bonhoeffer said in the beginning of his book that we're reading, where he said, like, there's some things that we shouldn't say. I, don't, I, don't, I think he was wrong there. Nothing's out of bounds with God. Nothing is precluded or inappropriate. Everything belongs in this conversation of the heart. Everything must be brought to speech before God, addressed to God, because he is the final reference for everything that's overwhelming us in our heart. We need to bring it to God. So the function of these psalms of disorientation is that the psalm may evoke reality for those who are engaged in self-deception and still imagine and pretends that life is all good and dandy, when in fact life is not good and dandy. And that the denial may be that they're denying the brokenness of a relationship, a, a lost job, a medical diagnosis, whatever they're denying. The harsh and abrasive speech of a statement of disorientation may penetrate the, the, the deception they're walking in and say, you know, no, this is what your life is like. You're sinking in the mire of a pit. You're surrounded by enemies. Wake up. In some spent sense, you know, this is just like a, something that absolutely is a shout. It's, it's a shout in our darkness. The Psalms, a lot of these psalms of disorientation move from petition and plea, or crying out, to praise of God. And that break between the petition and the plea and the crying out is a great moment of realism, a great moment of understanding not just the evil, but understanding the light. And uh, there's a turn from yearning for what was old and what was past to a recognition that I can now receive something new and something good, that God is not a God of resuscitation of the old, but God is a God of resurrecting into something that is new. And so we need to bring everything to speech to God. <clears throat> Here are a few examples. Psalm 86. Bow down your ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Right? He's, this is a state of realism. He's recognizing his state. Preserve my life, for I am holy. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. O God, the proud have risen against me, and a mob of violent men have sought my life and have not set you before them. 
But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. How about Psalm 79? This is a big psalm of disorientation. Verse 2. The dead bodies of your servants they have given as food for the birds of the heavens. You're talking like all the priests, all the Levites who serve at the temple. Can you imagine this scene? The dead bodies of your servants, they have given as food for the birds of heavens. The whole world is falling apart, right? The flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. You know, the dogs are going around and getting dinner. Their blood they have shed like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to those who are around us. Let the groaning of the prisoner come before you according to the greatness of your power. Preserve those who are appointed to die and return to our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom, the reproach with which they have reproached you, O Lord. Um, times of disorientation wake us up. Uh, I'm going to get to that here in a minute when I mention the life of a lot of people. They woke David up. We'll talk a little bit about the life of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, whose life went through the ringer and was waking up. You know, Israel's biggest waking up moment was Babylon, exile. You know, Psalm 137 is about that exile. They recognized the darkness. They called Babylon darkness. You know, sometimes we got to recognize that we are not to sing the songs of God in Babylon because Babylon is darkness. Those songs are reserved for God. Now we sing to God in our darkness, but we don't sing about the glories of Babylon. We sing about the glories of God. And we don't sing for the sake of our enemy. We sing for the sake of God. We sing for the sake, you know. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. We wept. You know, some people might have just recognized, might have just given in to the, the darkness, right? No, but they didn't. They wept when we remembered Zion. So we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive asked us a song, and those, you know, they're mocking them. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the root of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. So, sometimes we need to be shaken awake by the psalms of disorientation. We need the psalms of disorientation every season of life, just as we need the psalms of orientation. But most importantly, we need the psalms of new orientation. Because the Psalms of New Orientation are all about the goodness of God. They're all about the grace of God. They're all about the God that's mercies are new every morning, whose faithfulness is great. So the Psalms of New Orientation, I have a slide here. The speaker and the community of faith are often surprised by grace when there emerges in present life a new possibility that is inexplicable. Neither derived nor extrapolated, but wrought by the inscrutable power and goodness of God. That newness cannot be explained, predicted, or programmed. This is where the gospel is heralded as good news. That God is the resurrecting God. He is not a resuscitating God. He gives us a new life, not our old one. We enter into the new things that the Lord has for us. We don't have to stay stuck in the old. We can move forward. You know, Paul, he did not stay stuck in his past. Right in Philippians, he says, I press on that I may lay hold of all that for which Christ Jesus also lay hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. When we read the Psalms of new orientation, we remember to press forward to that which is new, to that which is good, to that which God is going to surprise us in grace with. 
So we can be excited when we see these. And all the, a lot of the Psalms of New Orientation, sometimes they are at the end of the Psalms of Disorientation. That move from plea to praise, that movement that we go through in life, we recognize this is what we get and now receive from God. Because God is the giver of all good things. He is the Father of life who lavishly gives gifts to His children. Right? Good gifts. Psalms 30, 11. You have turned... For me, my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. How about Psalm uh, uh, 40, verse 1? I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. How about Psalm 66? For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You've caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. But you brought us out to rich fulfillment. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare to you what he has done for my soul. You know that, but you have brought us out to rich fulfillment is huge. The buts of God are big buts. When the Bible says, but God, you say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. But God brought us through. You know, we go through the water. We go, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't hang out there. There are meadows of splendor waiting for us in the future. There is rich fulfillment that the but God is bringing us to. In Jesus Christ, we have a hope, a confident assurance that there is always something good ahead. Right? Like David says at the end of Psalm 27, he opens it up and says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then he ends it with the great but God. He said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. (laughs) The Psalms of New Orientation are grounding us in the but God of Scripture. Like the Apostle Peter said, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And that same but God is what God wants to do for us. We are not those who shrink back, but are those who press forward to the saving of the soul. There is something good ahead, always. That's why we always need to read the Psalms of New Orientation, no matter what state we are in, okay? Because they work on us in that way. Um, You know, there's a lot of... You know, every life really bears witness in some sense to orientation, disorientation, and new orientation. We see that with King David in the Psalms. And uh, some lives bear a deeper witness to it than others. Uh, They go through deeper waters. Uh, They go through more miry clay. And those lives really give us diamonds of people who have boldness and brightness unlike some others. Like they just have, you know, they are just, they cut through the darkness. They're prophetic voices, right? One one such life, I, uh, I, I like reading a lot of different Russian novelists. And one guy is named Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was the -the run-of-the-mill atheistic socialist under Vladimir Lenin, under uh, communistic Russia, who grew up in uh, Russia right post the 1917 revolution. You know what it took to shake this atheist communist who was an up-and-coming budding star in Russia? It took the Russian prison camps to shatter his world. It took the Russian cancer ward for him to find God. But it transformed his life. And he wrote a lot of books. 
that brought people to awareness of the evil of communistic Russia. One of his first books was called One Day in the Life of Ivan Den Denisovich. Soon after he was released, I think he was in prison eight or ten years. And his descriptions of life in the trenches and the dead cold winter are heart-wrenching. For instance, he says this in that book. It was at the evening recount on their return through the gates that the prisoners, freezing and famished, found the icy wind hardest to bear. A bowl of thin cabbage soup, half burned, was as welcome to them as rain to parched earth. They'd swallowed in one gulp that bowl of soup. It was, it was dearer than freedom, dearer than life itself, past, present, and future. So soon after his deep suffering in the prison camps for several years, where he nearly starved to death, like many others, he was sent to a cancer ward where he was told he was about to die of an extremely progressed form of cancer. He didn't die, and after that he would write a book called Cancer Ward that would win the Nobel Prize, would be banned from Soviet Russia, but would bring, after they did allow it after a lot of political pressure, would bring uh, much awareness to the people. So. His many uh, descriptions of how cancer broke proud people and turned the unlikely to God is something that is always the case throughout history. You know, That's what happens. God can change even the hardest hearts in times of trouble. In the pit, in the miry clay, people see they are human and dependent upon God. They cry to God for help. So, uh, you know, yeah. There's so many other examples we could use. One last example, we'll end with this. The example of the parable of the prodigal son. You know, the prodigal had a life of orientation in his father's house. Everything was well. He had everything he needed. Uh, but he had to go through disorientation before he could embrace new life with his father. He had to die in order to be resurrected. And it was only in the pit. It was only in the pigsty. It was only starving to death when he cried out for his father. That he cried out for forgiveness. But you know what? In that moment of disorientation, <laughs> there was right at it, the, the but God. There was the moment of new orientation. That he came to an absolute surprise of grace. That his confession to his father was interrupted. That he came home to a feast with singing and dancing. That he came home to a father who's the father of resurrection. The Father's anger is but for a moment, but His loving kindness is forever. Amen? So aren't you glad for all the different kinds of psalms? And they not just help us in our seasons, but they help us see the lives of those around us in the seasons that everyone goes through. Amen? So we'll take a five-minute break now. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to give a handout. Uh, I don't have it, but uh I we'll have it soon. Yeah, that